Okay, sorry about that. We had a little bit of a technical problem, so I have to put this second part, I had to make like a second half to part three of our lecture today. Now, we were talking about the idea of the West Antarctic Ice Sheet and how it could collapse or whatever. Um, this is a little hard to visualize, and frankly, this little cross-section diagram here that they provide is not particularly helpful. It's, it's complicated how the West Antarctic Ice Sheet is sitting on the Antarctic continent, but you can kind of get a sense by looking at this cross-section here that part of it is on the continent per se, and part of it is sort of cantilevered out in the form of the Ross Ice Shelf. And this diagram doesn't really do it justice that part of that Ross Ice Shelf is sort of itself grounded on a kind of a rock formation out near its leading edge. And so you can think of this ice sheet, the West Antarctic ice sheet, is sort of like it's sliding off the continent, but its leading edge is sort of stuck on a rock formation out at sea. It's a little more complicated than that. There's, it doesn't move as a single sheet and all that, but the basic idea you can picture is how like it's sort of like an avalanche waiting to happen, okay? It's sort of like it's sliding off the continent, but it's holding itself against this rock formation underwater, and it is gradually melting back, and at some point it will no longer be touching that rock formation that's keeping it from sliding off the continent. And so, in kind of a doomsday sense of the word, people sometimes kind of picture this as like an avalanche that's just waiting to happen. As this melting is happening, sooner or later, the leading edge of the uh, West Antarctic ice sheet comes un attached from that rock formation uh, out there, out over the, uh, the Ross Sea, and the whole thing starts sliding. But don't picture this as like a catastrophe in the sense of like, and then brrr, the right ice sheets start to move and go chasing down, uh, sliding down the, you know, into the ocean with a giant splash and a tidal wave. Uh, since we just a few moments ago talked about a book by Kim Stanley Robinson, um, uh, 40, Day, 40 Signs of Rain, it reminded me that actually another one of his books called Blue Mars, uh, that's exactly what happens in that. He loves these eco-disaster scenarios. And in that, in Blue Mars, um, I think it's a volcanic eruption under the West Antarctic ice sheet uh, causes the whole thing to catastrophically slide off of the continent and into the ocean and catastrophically make ocean levels several meters higher worldwide. And it's, it's a pretty cool thing. Uh, is that really, though, what... By the way, it's not a terribly great book, but it, it, if, if you're going to read a good eco-disaster, you can, you, can, you can do worse. Um, but is that really what's going to happen? All available modeling studies tell us that, the West, that... Well, let's turn to Greenland first, actually. The situation in Greenland is simpler in some ways. The, the ice sheets in Greenland are not unstable like that. They're melting back. They're melting more every year, but all modeling studies that we have of the dynamics of the Greenland ice sheet are telling us that the Greenland ice sheet is going to decrease significantly in area and volume as the climate gets warmer, which makes sense, and overall there'll be less mass on the Greenland ice sheet, which makes sense. Remember back in Module 1 we talked about GRACE, the gravity recovery and whatever experiment where a satellite was using gravity to actually measure the mass of the Greenland ice sheet. And we saw that the mass of the Greenland ice sheet was decreasing. So that makes some measure of sense, but it's a little bit more complicated to track down that mass balance of the uh, of Antarctica. Um, because there's going to be losses of mass due to melting, but there's also going to be increased precipitation in, 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 uh, in Western Antarctica over the Western Antarctic ice sheet. All of this is very complicated then is for the actual mass balance of the sheet and the rates of where the melting is happening and so on. The IPCC AR5 did as they are supposed to do. They did an analysis of all the available best research and so on, and they determined that the available evidence suggests that it is unlikely that the ice sheets of either Greenland or West Antarctica are going to suffer some kind of near-complete disintegration in the 21st century. <laughs> ah, I love that part about in the 21st century. In other words, beyond that, all bets start to be off. Okay. Just to turn back to West Antarctica then, that does seem to be the consensus of the, of modern research, is that the West Antarctic ice sheet is certainly not very stable. It might be slightly stable, it might be a little bit unstable, but melting is not doing it any good, and the mass gains up on the, on the continent itself due to increased precipitation are not doing it any good, 
and it will collapse in this climate regime. It's just not clear how long, and it doesn't collapse catastrophically. I mean, it still moves at the speed of moving ice. You know, it's not an avalanche, it's a glacier. Well, it's not a glacier, it's an ice sheet, but the same sort of thing. I mean, it moves on the order of feet per year, okay? So, I mean, it, once it starts to collapse in the slide of the ocean, it's not some giant avalanche. It's something that still itself takes centuries. Okay. Let's talk about some more of these doomsday scenarios with regard to possible ways climate could change in the more distant future. One is, of course, the whole business of that release of all that carbon that's stored in permafrost. I mean, there's an obvious possibility here for a feedback, right, where warmer climates mean permafrost melts, which causes more carbon to be released into the atmosphere as bacteria can take advantage of the organic material that is frozen in the, uh, into the ice sheet. And changes in permafrost are basically irreversible, certainly not reversible on the scale of millennia. It takes a very long time to get carbon back out of the atmosphere and stored in the form of permafrost by first extracting the carbon from the atmosphere, putting it into material like roots and so on, and the plants and decaying veg uh, vegetation, and then freezing it in the soil. I actually was just reading in National Geographic Kids, of all places, that a lot of the carbon stored in permafrost is actually in the form of, believe it or not, poop from mammoths, <laughs> which I guess makes a measure of sense, right? I mean, they concentrated a bunch of carbon. Mammoths ate a bunch of vegetation, concentrated the carbon waste into their waste, and uh, you know it would freeze. And uh, that's pretty cool. I, I don't know that the National Geographic Kids is necessarily the best source of information or whatever, but um, presumably it's based loosely, at least on some science, uh, some studies or something. Um, now, we talked before about the fact, though, that modeling studies of permafrost balance in, and the carbon balance in the permafrost and so on um, that are not really all that well done. We frankly don't really know very much about the soil physics and the, and the biogeochemical processes involved in breaking down stuff, that, organic materials that have been frozen for millennia and so on. And so they don't yield a lot of, these models are not leading a lot of coherent ideas about what, how fast the permafrost will uh, thaw out and how quickly that carbon returns to the atmosphere and so on. There's a lot of spread between the different models. And so we have pretty low confidence in those results. And that also ref basically just reflects our inherent poor understanding of the relevant processes and work. It sounds like something that science needs to spend some time on. It sounds like the kind of thing that, once again, an Earth System Science class would do a great deal to help us with. Here's another one of those really spectacular ways that climate could go horribly wrong, especially in the distant future. The catastrophic release of methane clathrates. Oh boy, methane clathrates. Now this is a word you might not be familiar with. More commonly, people refer to this as methane ice. Um, you know, we think of methane as a gas. That's what natural gas is, you know, like that you might use in your stove or something like that. Um, and at the temperatures and pressures observed in the atmosphere, it is a gas. But at the right, you know, like many substances, there's a phase diagram you could talk about in chemistry or physics or something, where under certain combinations of temperature and pressure, you could find out which phase it wants to be in, uh, methane wants to be in. And in the case of certain combinations of low temperature, not extraordinary low, like near zero Celsius, and high pressure, fairly high pressure, Methane actually exists in the form of an ice. It's a solid. It's a flammable solid. It's actually, it looks like ice, but it burns. It's, it's methane. And um, we use words like methane ice and methane clathrate to describe it. There are slightly different forms of the crystals and things like that. But the conditions under which that methane forms like that is actually not all that rare. It's basically pretty common right on the sea floor, especially once you're more than, you know, a kilometer or so down. Um, the temperatures are all right around zero to three degrees Celsius, and the pressure's in the right range, that methane tends to form in the form of uh, clathrate. So what happens is decomposing organic material that rains down from up above, you know, dead plankton and fish poop and whatever. This has been a poop-intensive lecture. And it gets down to the bottom of the ocean, and then as it is uh, decomposed, it releases methane, but at those temperatures and pressures, it tends to, uh, to accumulate in the form of methane ice rather than bubbling out. I mean, something very similar happens in, say, swamps. Swamp gas is methane. And when vegetation and dead animals and stuff like that decompose in the swamp, they release methane. 
but we're only talking a few feet deep water. The pressure is not deep enough, and the water is too warm for methane and clathrates to form. So, okay, um, we've got this stuff, and in fact, there's a lot of it. Once we knew what to look for, actually, the ocean floor is covered with this stuff. There's a lot of methane ice, on, especially like in the Caribbean, in the Gulf of Mexico, and also parts of the Arctic. There just happens to be a lot of ocean area that is at the right range of depths for the right pressure and so on. Um, and obviously, there's energy companies who'd love to exploit this stuff. There are actually, there's probably actually more energy available in the form of fossil fuels that are, you know, methane clathrates on the bottom of the ocean than there are in the form of petroleum in rock formations or tar sands or methane trapped in shale formations and so on on land. This is a lot of fossil fuels potentially out there. Of course, exploiting it would be a disaster, right? I mean, not only in terms of the, um, you know, greenhouse gases that would be released, but I mean, can you imagine the environmental impact of like effectively dredging and mining the bottom of the ocean? Um, I mean, this is, it's not a practical thing. Oh, someday we're gonna have the technology to do this, aren't we, rats? Um, so this stuff is pretty widespread and there's a problem with it. Because, you know, it, these methane clathrates, they exist at a particular range of temperatures and pressures. As it happens, a lot of the ocean is just barely cold enough for methane clathrates to exist in the form of these ices. Um, most of the deep ocean is pretty uniformly right around 3 degrees Celsius. It has to do with the fact that that's the temperature at which seawater is most dense. Um, well, that turns out to be cold enough for methane clathrates to exist, but just barely. Well, you can see exactly where there's going to go. We're going to have the planet warming. Now, most of that warming, of course, is at the surface, but even a little bit of warming of the deep ocean could result in a catastrophe. We could actually start converting the methane ices back into the gas form. They go straight from a, they sublimate, they go straight from an ice to a, to a gas at those pressures and temperatures. And then methane bubbles out of the ocean just like it bubbles out of the swamp in the form of swamp gas. So now we're taking a powerful greenhouse gas and releasing it back up into the atmosphere. Oh man, that's a catastrophe. If we get the ocean just a little bit warmer, and we're talking on the order of like two tenths of a degree Celsius or something like that, we start having a lot of methane clathrates start changing back into gaseous methane and we could have a feedback here where then we have even more warming due to all that methane and what a mess. What a mess. Um, is this going to happen? Well, the IPCC Era 5 is there to evaluate the evidence about such things, and they determined that such a catastrophic release of methane clathrates in the 21st century was unlikely. Very unlikely. We'd have to look up their definitions. Very unlikely is like, what, 0 to 9% or something like that. Okay, um, I don't like those odds all that much, but they're better than them telling us it's likely or something like that. On the other hand, keep in mind, they're saying this century. The truth of the matter is we don't really know very much about how ocean currents and the deep ocean are going to change. Heck, we don't know that much about the deep ocean now. Um, I mean, the truth is it's very expensive and difficult to explore. We don't know very much about what determines its temperature and structure and so on. But... We know that beyond the current century, it starts getting pretty likely that we're going to start seeing these kind of catastrophic release of these methane clathrates. You know, another really horrible thing that's coming is the fact that changes in climate are really bad for plants because plants can't move. Okay? It's a tragedy. It's a nightmare that there's going to be climate refugees who are seeking out, you know, moving. They are, they are migrating to new parts of the world because of climate. But you know what? In some ways, that's better than what the plants get because the plants can't go anywhere. And so one of these scenarios that we're worried about is the possibility that there could be diebacks of forests, both tropical forests and boreal forests. Boreal meaning like northern forests, deciduous type forests. Um, yeah, boreal forests. Deciduous is a bad choice of words. Um... And so if the environment changed enough that forests become unhealthy and die back, then you could be releasing carbon into the atmosphere that has previously been sequestered in the land biosphere in the form of wood and leaves and roots.
roots and things like that as it is decomposed and you could build a vegetation feedback. This word vegetation feedback is an interesting little idea here. Vegetation feedbacks are when changes in climate lead to changes in vegetation and then the changes in the vegetation change the climate. Now that could actually happen, there's a number of proposed vegetation feedbacks that can involve things like um, the, the albedo of the forest changing as the forest starts to die or the rates of evaporation of water and evapotranspiration of water off of the forest as the forest, forest starts to die. But really the main for long-term climate what we're worried about is as forests die back, will they be releasing carbon dioxide into the environment? And they're, you know, they're dying because there's too much carbon dioxide and then they release more carbon into the atmosphere. Uh, that's a really nasty vegetative feedback. And it turns out this is very, very difficult to predict. Um, you know, we have a set of seven primitive equations that can describe the physics of how atmospheres change. Or there's a slightly different set of seven equations that can describe how oceans change. But systems like a forest aren't really well described by like a handful of physical equations that can model it in the future. And so we have to kind of use more of our just understanding of forestry and so on as to what could happen. And that doesn't give us a lot of insights because most of our understanding of what forests are like and how they survive are for present climate. We just don't really know how that same forest would respond to prolonged elevated temperatures and things like that, more temperature extremes on the high end and uh, fewer colder nights and so on. This is a complex combination of like the precipitation that affects the forest, the temperatures that affect the forest, and also things like pests that live in the forest, you know, borers and things like that that can kill the trees and so on might have different ranges of climate that work for them. So this is actually a really hard thing to get a handle on. Um, and the IPCC did their best and they basically said we have very low confidence in any of these results. Low confidence meaning here that the results are all over the place. They're not saying we're, going, we're not going to have a vegetation feedback and forests aren't going to die back, but they're saying that the studies are kind of all over the place. We don't really know. Somebody's going to be right, but we don't know which one. They're all too different. We have low confidence that we understand this process. We're not saying it's not going to happen. We're saying we don't have an under, sufficient understanding of the processes that are going to lead to that. Oh, that's not, I don't have trouble sleeping tonight thinking about that. What about another climate catastrophe that could be coming? What about the eventual disappearance of summer sea ice in the Arctic? That's good. coming. Probably. Well, is it? Well, we talked about that briefly a couple lectures ago. We talked about the fact that many models show that that's going to happen in the 21st century. And actually, quite a few of the members of the model ensemble showed that happening um, by the year 2050 and some as early as 2037 if I remember right um, it's going to happen at some point in the future we will have, be living in a world with no sea ice and we really don't know how to fix that I mean well how to fix it I mean that is a, that's a kind of irreversible set climate change too we can melt the ice back you know the, the, the summer sea ice, can multi-year ice, can disappear very quickly and takes a very long period of time to build back up. Um, that's another example of an irreversible climate change. and We don't really know how well our models are handling that. I mean, the truth of the matter is we have no data from buoys and ships and stuff like that from an ice-free Arctic. We can't test and see if the circulations that our model is coming up with are realistic because we don't know what the realistic currents look like. So we're kind of just hoping the models know what they're doing there, but this is a good example of a catastrophe that could be coming, and we don't really even have a good sense. I mean, it could be coming. In this case, it's, it is, it's coming. We're going to have an ice-free Arctic in the summer. We're going to have all kinds of crazy ice albedo feedbacks in our climate that we don't have to deal with now. And not to mention, of course, the ecological tragedy if you're a polar bear or something. And we just don't really even know if we have any of that right. I mean, there's just no way to know. How about another abrupt climate change? The, the creation of mega droughts. Now, I don't like this word mega drought, but there really isn't a better term. But let's be clear, a mega drought is not really a defined term as in like I could show you something from the glossary of meteorology and it'll tell you about this here. But if we actually wanted to like come up with some kind of definition of it, well, let me put it this way. We really need some kind of definition of it because the public really believes in this. 
there are other classes you can take at Creighton, for example, where they're definitely concerned about the, about desertification and the growth of, of deserts and so on. I don't like that word desertification, but uh, and the creation of mega droughts and so on. And you know, you see these alarming headlines like NASA says that mega droughts lasting decades. During mega drought lasting decades is 99% certain in American Southwest. Okay, I didn't even bother reading the whole article there because this seems very strange. Like, as if it'll ever happen again, I, I don't even really care. Um, mega droughts are these going to be these droughts that are going to last more than 20 years. That's a pretty substantial drought. That's even a bigger drought than, say, the Dust Bowl, okay, in the, 20, in the 1930s. That's a bigger drought than, say, what we recently, in recent years, have come out of from California, where it was about a seven-year drought or something like that. These kind of mega droughts that last on the order of a few decades um, are things that are known to exist, both in human history and in, like, the paleoclimate record. We know that there have been periods of time where there have been multi-decadal droughts, sometimes even multi-century droughts in regions. And we know that these things have happened from, like I said, from fossil records, from paleoclimate records, as well as, like, you know, there have been major droughts in Africa, for example, through, like, much of, from, like, the 70s to the 90s, much of West Africa had an extreme drought, much of Ethiopia had an extreme drought in East Africa, and so on. Now, what are we talking about when we talk about mega droughts, then, as a possible abrupt climate change in the future? Well, while previous mega droughts were for natural reasons, uh, many climate models are projecting that some regions, including the American Southwest, could have a uh, period of ar aridif I hate that word, aridification, in the words becoming more dry, and that could be interpreted in the model as a mega drought, and as there is a general expansion of the tropical belt, these parts of the world become increasingly under the subtropical highs places where, at least with irrigation, agriculture is possible, wouldn't be in the future, where much of the precip much of the drinking water comes in the form of snow in the mountains in the winter, that kind of stuff wouldn't be happening anymore. This is a major policy issue and so on. But not all the models see it, not all the models would be able to represent it even if they wanted to, and the IPCC AR5 is not that confident about this. They are saying there's just too much difference between the different models um, in terms of what they see happening, especially in the American Southwest, to actually be able to say with any kind of confidence that's going to happen. That doesn't mean it's not going to happen. That means that somebody's going to be right about whether it happens or not. We just don't know yet who that is. That's what low confidence means. Mega droughts could happen, but you don't really need a 30-year drought to cause a lot of disruption. I mean, for example, we could just change when and how long the rainy season in a place lasts. You know, the monsoon. Now, some of you who are in this class have taken my ATS 553 class, Tropical Meteorology. It's more like a tropical climate class. We learn about how things like monsoons work. And monsoons in their summer season, places that have a monsoon climate in their summer season, it's very wet. And more than a billion people in the world depend on monsoon precipitation for their irrigation, for their drinking water, etc. Um... Monsoons are a very important part of our climate system as it exists right now, and their how they form is very well understood. Monsoons are a weather pattern that in which we get rain in the precipitation and it, uh, rain in, rain in the summer and in this and then it's dry in the winter in a monsoon. And these monsoons happen because of the difference in the temperature between the surface of the land in the tropics and the surface of the water around the continental land masses in the tropics. So if in the summer, like the Indian continent gets so much hotter than the Bay of Bengal and the Arabian Sea around it, and you drive a monsoon circulation that creates all this precipitation over India in the summer. Same sort of thing with like tropical West Africa. Uh, the West African continent heats up so much more than the water around it during the summer and it drives this monsoon circulation and puts all this precipitation over tropical West Africa. Um, So that temperature differential between the land and the ocean is key to making monsoons work. And we've already seen in previous uh, lectures in this module that one of the consequences we are expecting in the future, based on these modeling studies, is that temperatures should increase more over land than they do over the ocean. 
So, let's see. If we're going to have... Uh, does that mean we're going to have a stronger... Well, let me think about this for a second here. I mean, I got a billion people's livelihood on, uh, um, on the line here. Let's think about this for a minute. If I'm going to have a change in the difference between the temperatures of the land and the temperatures of the ocean, how will that make the monsoon different? Is that going to make the monsoon longer or shorter at a given location? Is it going to make the monsoon more moist, like there's going to be more rain, or drier, like there's going to be less? Maybe the monsoon is going to shift farther north, or, you know, more, the right word we use is poleward in tropical meteorology. We're going to shift the monsoon poleward farther, or maybe it won't shift as far poleward. It'll be equatorward of its original position. Um, on my resume, I say that I'm a monsoon meteorologist. And even I'm not sure what the answer is here, okay? I mean, the truth is, this is pretty far outside of our experience of how monsoons work, this kind of climate change. But it's going to make a change, okay? There's going to be longer monsoons or shorter monsoons. There's going to be drier monsoons or wetter monsoons. I don't know, and no one does either. Uh-oh. And, you know, like, again, the IPCC says nobody really knows it. But we do know that there's unlikely to be a complete collapse of the monsoon system into like a dry climate regime any time in the 21st century. That's one of the possibilities here is that the difference may become so much that the monsoon just doesn't even work anymore. Um, but that's unlikely to happen in the 21st century. But changes as in like the monsoon propagates farther north than it used to and places that used to not get rain now get a lot and places that used to rely on the monsoon, the monsoon passes them by. This could become a really big mess. Oh man, this whole business of monsoons and climate could also just be a really big change, you know, with only a billion lives on the line. If it sounded kind of unsatisfying, if it sounds like the uncertainty in a lot of this stuff that turns out to matter most made you uncomfortable, you're right. This is part of the problem. The kinds of things that the public and policymakers and so on really most want to know is the stuff we kind of have the least handle on. We understand the physics of like the radiative forcings and stuff really well, and atmospheric constituents and so on, and aerosol concentrations and so on. We have a pretty good understanding too of things like temperature patterns and humidity patterns and so on. But when you start getting into the nitty gritty details of the kinds of things the public really wants to know, like is the Antar how high are sea levels going to rise if West Antarctic ice sheet collapses? That gets a lot more complicated, okay? Or uh, do we need to worry that the Indian monsoon is going to fail? Those are the kind of things we actually have the least certainty about. All right, we've made it to the end of this long lecture. Let me ask you a couple more questions before we're all done. Question seven. How do mo numerical models of the atmosphere simulate the effects of something like disruptive technology or abrupt socioeconomic change and how that would affect future climates? Is it A, they use the seven primitive equations to predict the development of these disruptive technologies or these abrupt socioeconomic changes? Is it B, they assume that all such changes will happen in the first 10 years of a model simulation? Or C, they don't. All right, make a choice of those three options and get a little feedback before you move on to question eight.